Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Seb Falk. Seb is a historian, teacher, broadcaster, and historical consultant. He teaches medieval history at and, and history of science at Cambridge University. And today, we will speak about his book, The Light Ages, The Surprising Story of Medieval Science. Seb, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So your book is full of revelations. Uh, everyone think of the mi uh, Middle Ages as this dark period of history where nothing happened. And you tell us, tell us otherwise. You tell us this, there was a rich scientific, well, we don't, you don't use the term scientific community, but you know, science was alive and, and developing. And, and so this is a great revelation for many of us. I wonder if we could start by you telling us a little bit about your background. How is it that you got interested in this subject? I mean, history is so, past so so far in the past that uh, we i don't know if we even think it's relevant today hmm. yeah i mean i think i i was never entirely motivated to study history by how relevant it was today i think i was really interested in history initially because i just found it exciting because i loved the stories i loved uh, the idea of kind of people living in a completely different way and in, in having things that we didn't have or not having things that we do have um, and thinking differently from us. So for me, history has always been a kind of time travel. History has always been about uh, tourism into the past, if you like. You know, they say, it's a cliche, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Uh, and so for me, uh, traveling into the past, studying history is like uh, journeying to a different continent and, and seeing how people do things and, and trying to immerse yourself in it, learning the language, living with the people for a while, and then you can come back to your own time, your own place, uh, and have a new appreciation, uh, both for the place you visited as well as for your own uh, experiences and your own opportunities. Uh, so that's kind of what always motivated me to study history. And I was interested in the Middle Ages uh, from quite a young boy because I read all these stories of knights and I read about Robin Hood and, and all this kind of thing. Um, so it was always a period that, that interested me. Uh, and here in the UK, um, our school system, uh, some people think it's good, I don't think it's very good, uh, forces you to choose between um, different subjects at quite a young age. Uh, so you can't study a kind of baccalaureate like they do in many countries, or, or at least not, not that many teenagers can do that. So you have to choose sciences or humanities. Uh, and I didn't like that because I was always kind of an all-rounder. So I was always interested in history and in science, and I studied uh, languages as well. And, um, and so I wanted to kind of do all these things. Uh, and I went to university, I studied history and Spanish at university, a kind of joint course. Um, and then I went and worked in the civil service in the UK government uh, for a few years. Then I became a teacher, a school teacher, and really enjoyed teaching. Uh, and after a few years of teaching in uh, the UK and in Canada uh, on Vancouver Island, um, I uh, came back to the UK to do a master's and I just kind of fell into history of science because it seemed like a topic that was kind of new and stimulating and exciting uh, in that um, it's relevant to so many different things and science is so poorly understood by so many people. Um, you know, they, they either ignore science and kind of think that science is somehow sort of fraudulent or not really relevant to them or they idolize science and they put it on a pedestal and they say that you know science is this perfect thing uh, of course it's neither of those things science is a, a human product a fantastically productive and, and ingenious and, and wonderful thing that humans have done but nonetheless with all the failings that humans always have so I studied it for a master's and I did a PhD. And in the course of my PhD research, I came across uh, John Westwick, who was a monk who lived in the 14th century. And I decided I had to write a book about him and that through him, I could tell people about medieval science and show people uh, that the Middle Ages was not all about wars and plagues, but that people were looking at the world around themselves and, 
and asking questions and, and doing science. Okay, so if you had to put a date, uh, what's the beginning and the end of the, uh, of the Middle Ages? Uh, well, um, the kind of traditional rough starting point is about 500 AD um, after the fall of the Roman Empire, and it ends kind of with the Renaissance in about 1500. So I think you can put particular events, but you're always, it's always going to be an argument. Um, and of course, it's different times in different places. Traditionally, the Middle Ages is kind of a European concept, right? And some people say, well, you shouldn't really talk about medieval China or, um, you know, medieval Africa. Um, but these days, people are sort of more comfortable with that idea and just say, well, look, medieval just means roughly the period 500 to 1500 AD. Um, and, um, and so anything that's happening then, we can call it medieval. Um, so it depends on where you are. I grew up with this idea that the Middle Ages came to a grinding halt in 1485 when uh, King Henry VII won the Battle of Bosworth. But of course, that has no relevance outside England, really. So, um, so it, it depends on where you are. So actually, it's a huge period of almost 2000 years. So it would be very difficult in my mind to describe, let's say, a city look like this or the normal day to day life look this or the other way. So uh, I, this is a very difficult question, it's considering that it's such a huge time period, but someone like me who doesn't know anything about history ask you, can you describe a, a city in the Middle Ages? Let's say a popular city, what would it be? Uh, uh, Paris or London or, or, or anything Paris else? Paris was, was quite a um, popular city for, for Western Europe. Constantinople uh, was the, the largest city in the, in the Christian world uh, in that era. Uh, Chang'an in China was, was enormous, although I, can, I guess declining by the end of the Middle Ages. Um, Baghdad, uh, Cairo, you know, um, a large number of important cities and um, becoming increasingly urbanized. So uh, like today, really, you know, the cities are the kind of hubs of trade. They're where people come to make their fortune. They're where people come to trade. But of course, far more than today, um, the majority of the population living outside the cities, living in rural areas, um, existing through subsistence farming. Um, but a large amount of trade um, in the Middle Ages, as you say, there's a huge amount of change that happens in the European Middle Ages. Um, and, um, and that includes things like the foundations of the universities. It includes the foundations uh, of the uh, Christian orders of friars and things which allow people to become educated, which allow them to travel more widely. Um, but it also includes really the establishment of uh, large international trading networks. Um, so, you know, around the year 1000 is, is when um, trade across Eurasia really uh, becomes established. Uh, but of course, it, it becomes kind of cut off to some extent after the Mongols uh, in, the, in the sort of 13th and 14th centuries uh, make their way across Eurasia and, and conquer large large periods. But, but the Middle Ages, as you say, it's a thousand years. It's a thousand years in which a huge amount happens. We see essentially the rise of Christianity to a global religion. We see the foundation and the rise of Islam. Um, we see, uh, you know, the, the height and, and to some extent the fall of, of China as a world power. We see uh, the heyday of, of Islam as a world power. Uh, we see um, the Mongol conquests, which, you know, changed the face of human history. Um, and of course, we see things happening in the Americas too, um, of kind of equal significance, but perhaps uh, obviously with less communication with, with uh, other continents, uh, less relevant to kind of my story, which is more of a European one, really. Right. In my mind, I picture uh, as uh, an achievement of that time period, the huge catechals. Uh I went to uh, Europe, I went to Germany, and I saw... Uh, this amazing piece of arts that were started and finished it, uh, within a few hundred years periods. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, in fact, there is something called cathedral thinking that you start a project assuming that somebody else will finish it for you. So uh, 
so I assume that's one of the major uh, architectural uh, advances. And then to build those categories, you have to have certain amount of knowledge of mathematics. Uh, yeah, sure. Engineering. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly as you say, it's an incredible labor of love that people build those buildings, right? Because they build them knowing that they will never see them finished. Somebody in the news recently said that like billionaires super yachts were the same as medieval cathedrals. And it was the most ridiculous thing that I have ever heard about the Middle Ages because it's kind of the opposite, right? People build these things as gifts. Uh, you know, anybody can go into a cathedral. Anybody can, can marvel not only at the the engineering and, and the skill and the art, but also, of course, these were designed to make people marvel at God, right? They were designed to inspire people uh, to belief and to devotion. Um, and so these are kind of enormous civic buildings that are, you know, are sometimes paid for by the state, sometimes paid for by, um, you know, private wealthy individuals um, who are hoping that, that people will pray for them after they die. Um, and exactly as you say, they, they, um, bring in all of the latest artistic movements, but also the latest architectural knowledge and knowledge of engineering, and particularly in some of the early Renaissance um, architecture, the use of um, domes that are able to support these, you know, phenomenally heavy roofs um, by spreading the weight uh, using, you know, really very advanced physics for the day. Um, that's in in some ways the kind of most technologically advanced science that we see there. Okay, and today we are suffering of something as horrible as the COVID-19, but at that time there was also the Black Death. I wonder if you could make some parallels. <laughs> I'm sure there's not record, not that many records of it, but but to your the extent of your knowledge, how did they handle the Black Death at that time? Yeah, I mean, it's quite it's quite well documented, actually, the Black Death. Uh, although we're finding out new things about it all the time, especially with new DNA evidence in terms of how, how far it's spread. And it, it seems to have arisen in Central Asia um, in uh, the, the, the 13th century, uh, in the 1200s, uh, but it really hit uh, Europe and Western Europe and North Africa in the middle of the 14th century, in the 1340s. Um, and that's when it wiped out maybe up to a half, but certainly, you know, 40% of the population of Europe um, and had an enormous impact on the on the economy and the culture and society uh, of the time. And in many ways, there are comparisons that can be made um, because people, uh, it had this enormous disruptive impact on the economy, everything shut down, people were incredibly scared and confused. The science was desperately trying to catch up, right? Scientists thought they had a kind of an idea about what might be causing it, but um, you know, they were bringing in measures to counteract it. So we see some of the same kind of things, actually. You know, some of the social distancing or the, the quarantines uh, that we've seen uh, around the world this year uh, were also done in the Middle Ages. They had uh, quarantines, they had uh, rules about you know, what you could touch or who you could be in contact with, and where you could go. Um, so they had very similar rules, but of course they didn't have the understanding of microbiology that we have today to be able to understand that you know, this was a bacterial infection. Um, but what's really interesting about the Black Death is what's sometimes said about the Middle Ages is that people just believed what they were told to believe and that everybody believed the same thing. Well, that's complete nonsense. Um, there were you know at least three different explanations that were put forward uh, you know some people said that it was to do with the environment and it was to do with bad air and uh, you know um, stagnant water these kinds of things could bring it on some people said it was astrology they thought that it was in a planetary alignment that jupiter saturn and mars had all come into alignment and this had, had somehow had some effect on the earth bringing this disease out of the earth uh, and some people said of course that they were being punished by God. But, you know, it could be any of these things or all of these things, uh, you know, God working through these, um, these kind of earthly uh, practical measures, if you like. Um, so, you know, people had competing explanations. And of course, there were people just like the kind of anti-vaxxers or the people who think that, you know, Bill Gates is trying to inject a microchip into you or, you know, that masks are going to make you more ill than, than, than less. Um, you know, there are people at the time then who, you know, believed all kinds of 
um, outlandish things uh, about the plague as well. So I think we do see, of course, there are many, many differences and we're extremely lucky to live at a time when a vaccine can be developed in a matter of months and, and you know, spread, uh, well, at least to, to countries that can afford it so far, but hopefully around the world. Um, so we're very lucky, but it's very interesting to see how people react uh, in strikingly, sometimes quite comparable ways, because it is human nature to panic. It's also human nature to pull together. It's human nature to, to ask, why has this happened? Uh, and, and to try and come up with solutions. Wow. Um, another piece of exposure that I had to the Middle Ages and its history is movies about the crusade. The uh, Christians, Muslims, and I don't know what other religions were crusading against each other. So I, I wonder if you could just tell us what exactly was happening. What was, the, the, what was this historical event called the crusade? Mm, yeah. I mean, it's a complex historical event. It's very important in the history of medieval Christianity. How important it is in kind of world history is perhaps kind of slightly skewed by the fact that, that, that ultimately the history that we tell today is quite often the history of, of Western Europe, the Christian Europe. Um, from, from the point of view of the kind of long-term history of the Islamic world, it looks like a strange kind of weird aberration that this, you know, the Islamic world is doing extremely well. They're much more cultured, educated, uh, and wealthy uh, than, than um, Christianity in the 11th century when the Crusades were launched. And then along came the Crusaders, who are these kind of barbarous warriors who somehow managed to take Jerusalem, managed to conquer Jerusalem in 1095, uh, and then lose um, Jerusalem again 88 years later in 1080, uh, 1187 um, and then um, gradually the, the crusader kingdoms that were um, created or, or carved out in Palestine um, were, were kind of whittled away by successive rulers most famously Saladin uh, and then the crusader states were uh, essentially um, completely wiped out by um, the end of the 13th century. So the whole thing lasted less than 200 years. Um, and then, but then crusading kind of continues. So crusading is very important in the culture of medieval Christianity, because this idea is that you should be prepared to die for your faith, uh, that you are such a devout Christian that you're prepared to do anything. You're prepared to walk you know, thousands of miles across inhospitable country, including, you know, all the way across the deserts of Turkey, um, which wasn't Turkey then, of course, but Anatolia, um, all the way to Jerusalem uh, in order to, to kind of pray. But pilgrimage, of course, predates crusading. So this idea of traveling a long way to pray is a, is a very old one. And of course, many, many religions have pilgrimage, um, have, the, have this idea that you should journey and you should learn uh, and you should um, somehow undo your past wrongs uh, by going on a pilgrimage. What was special about crusading was that fighting was somehow um, uh, worthy and was somehow um, uh, what God wanted. And so um, they were told uh, by the Pope who launched the crusade in 1095 uh, that if they died uh, on crusade, uh, they uh, would, uh, their sins would be forgiven. Uh, any sins that they had uh, committed and, and confessed, uh, they would be forgiven. And so this idea was uh, that you would, um, you would go and you would fight, and if you died, then you would um, go to heaven. Uh, but of course, there were many people who um, saw this as a kind of an opportunity to get out of their life uh, in Europe, to get out of, uh, you know, the fact that they perhaps were um, not uh, very successful or they didn't have any land and that maybe this was kind of an opportunity. Um, but what we really see is uh, this idea uh, that somehow fighting can be something that, that God wants. Um, and the church kind of uses it to um, get the warriors out of Europe a little bit. Um, uh, and so it's tremendously violent, right? It's, it's, it's uh, uh, not a kind of something that should be glorified in many ways, you know, we, we see this idea of crusaders as being heroes and that a crusade is a good thing, right? You know, we have a crusade against this or a crusade against that, and it's, a, it's seen as a good thing. But the historical crusades were incredibly violent, and I think we should, um, you know, not forget that. Not least um, Jews, Jewish communities in Europe 
were often targeted by crusaders on their way to fight Muslims uh, and there was horrific violence against Jewish communities uh, in Europe and then of course there was all the violence against uh, Muslims as well um, uh, and, and of course uh, Muslims who defended themselves and, and many of the crusaders died too so it was you know a very bloody exciting um, but um, but ultimately I suppose pointless episode in European wow. history. Well, I, I have a few other questions. I, I think we're running our time limit. Uh, uh, so I, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, a question about yourself. Tell us about your um, historical consulting. You have, you are also a broadcaster. Do you have, a, I think you also have a podcast. Can you tell us what is it that you do nowadays to <laughs> spread the, uh, the knowledge of middle evil science? Yeah, so I mean, I, I will talk about medieval science whenever anybody asks me to, right? Because there was so much going on. People were asking so many questions about the world uh, and they were not ignorant. Uh, you know, they founded medieval universities. They studied the world. They calculated the size of the world. They watched the stars. They did so many um, amazing things. They invented machines like the thing behind me, this astrolabe, which is a kind of medieval smartphone for telling the time and for um, working out where you are and, and all this kind of thing. Um, so there's so much to say about medieval science. I could go on and on, but um, I, uh, as to what I do, um, I'm teaching in Cambridge University. Uh, I do radio work for the BBC. Um, I don't have my own podcast, but I do um, uh, programs often for BBC Radio 3, which is a, a BBC um, radio program, and, and, and many of those are available to stream or, or from my website, sebfork.com. Um, and so I've made uh, occasional films as well, some of them on YouTube, including how to use an astrolabe. Um, there's, a, there's a video that I've made on YouTube uh, for that, and of course, full instructions in my book as well. Um, and apart from that, you know, I'm, I'm mainly writing. I do some writing for, for um, book reviews and things for magazines or, you know, I've written occasional pieces for, for Time magazine and, and other things like that. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, just, just writing and researching uh, and, uh, and, and answering, consulting whenever anybody uh, needs uh, to know about, about the things I'm uh, reasonably expert in. Um, so I'm always happy, always happy to talk about medieval science. Perfect. Okay. So the last question is, could you tell us one more time the title of your book and where can the listeners follow you? Uh, so the title of my book is The Light Ages. Uh, if, you're, if you're listening to this in the UK, it's The Light Ages, uh, A Medieval Journey of Discovery. If you're listening to this in the USA or Canada, it's The Light Ages, The Surprising Story of Medieval Science. Uh, but it's the same book inside the cover. Um, and, um, and, and you, can, you can get it in hardback pretty soon in paperback, in audiobook, um, our, or of course ebook uh, from all of the usual um, small and large bookstores. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Seb underscore Falk or my website, sebfalk.com. Uh, and, uh, and do uh, feel free to reach out, get in touch, ask me any questions you may have. And, and, uh, and if you get hold of the book, I hope you enjoy it. Seb, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Hmm. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very enjoyable conversation. I had many more questions, but uh, the <laughs> time I usually just do sure. 25 minutes. So uh, I, I, it's going to take about a week before I publish this episode, and then I'll send you a link. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Take care.